Welcome back to Ovid Through the Ages. Today we're going to be talking about Ovid's reception in the medieval era. Ovid was extremely popular during the medieval era, and it's actually sometimes referred to as the Aetis Ovidius, which means the age of Ovid. The height of Ovid's vogue is said to be the 12th to the 14th century. He was used as a school text to teach Latin grammar to students and was a key source of mythology for the age. Ars Amatoria, or Art of Love, was one of his most popular works, surprisingly, considering that the Middle Ages were extremely Christian. He achieved the, a status as a proverbial teacher of love, and the book was actually used as sort of an erotic Bible. His biography fascinated people, especially those who felt real or spiritual exile during that time period. Ovid's considered an ethical poet because he wrote on the subject of behavior, but his ethics weren't exactly suited to the Christian age. Plus, he's still marked with the faults of exile and sexual, political, and theological transgressions in his own age. Also, the ancient Roman gods that, that Ovid wrote about in Metamorphoses weren't supposed to set a moral example like the god in the Christian religion is for people. So they met an obstacle there, because what Ovid wrote about didn't exactly fit with the morals of the Christian medieval period. So it was a common practice amongst these people to moralize Ovid in Christian terms. So Christian scholars, poets, and artists refigured the pagan myths to enhance and extend the meanings within a Christian context. Many wrote allegorized versions of Ovid in which they would um, translate Ovid and then they would say, oh, well, this myth really means this and put it into a Christian context with Christian morals and things, even quoting the scripture um, in the middle of Ovid to, to help people who are reading it along the right path morally. Um, a guy named Arnulf de Orleans wrote um, the first allegorized version and he interprets the myths historically, morally, and allegorically. And an anonymous monk wrote perhaps the most famous version of it called Ovid Moralisé in French to guide the reader response to Ovid's questionable morals. They also took issue with the Roman sexual ethics, which were at odds with the Christian heterosexual reproductive regime that was in place. Also, the whole idea of transforming things, which is at the very center of Ovid's metamorphoses, went against the Christian doctrine because they thought um, when God created something, it stayed that way, period. And also, the sexuality and gender presentation of the gods in the myths didn't work with Christianity, and it needed a lot of allegorizing to kind of rationalize that away. So, they would, as I said, add references to scripture in their commentaries and eliminate um, the moral judgment with predetermined morality. Now, it's not a stretch to think that Ovid probably wouldn't have liked this, because Ovid was very big on giving his readers the opportunity to work through the stories and their morals in their own way. So some examples of the allegorizing that they did are Orpheus, who was pretty clearly a lover of young boys. They said, oh, well, he's just attracted to the innocence in the young boys, turning him into a sort of Christ figure, and said that he wasn't attracted to women because they represented um, the weakness of sinners. Also, um, Diana, who um, enjoys the company of only women who renounce heterosexual desire, um, they compare her to the chaste Virgin Mary. So things like these. And there's a quote by one scholar that says, for Arn Arnulf, the guy who wrote one of these allegorized versions, the aim of the poet was entirely moral. By showing through the mutation of bodies and changes in spirit, which are inseparable from them, he brings us back to God inviting us to follow reason and to maintain the soul in its original form by keeping it clear of vice. So as you can see, these allegorizing people are starting to cross a little bit of a line, and they're so concerned with Ovid's morality that they're starting to say, oh, well, maybe he did write these as, as a Christian um, moral kind of thing. They went as far as to invent poems that he never even wrote to prove that he was a moral person. So a man named Richard de Fourbinel wrote um, *De Vitula*, which tells, which 
is um, supposed to have been written by Ovid, and tells of Ovid's conversion to Christianity and his renunciation of polytheism and sexuality, which is, like, not very likely. Anyway, they even went as far as to change his biography and his intentions that they wrote um, when he was writing the poem. One of his poems, Heroines, um, they said, oh, well, he, was try he wrote it to try and teach morals to the young people in this one city. And Ex Ponto, which is one of his exile poems, they said he was writing that to make sure that people didn't repeat his mistakes. Now, these aren't far stretches, but they, they definitely aren't probably why Ovid wrote the poems, and they're definitely people just trying to force them into a very Christian context. Now, by the 12th century, Orleans in France had become a, cent a major center for the study of classical Latin poetry, and Ovid was one of the main authors that they studied there. A guy named William of Orleans wrote a work on Ovid's poetics, word choice, and textual elements, and use this to teach students. So as you can see, it's not only the morals of Ovid they're concerned with, but his actual poetry as well. A book called The Vulgate was probably the most important comedy, uh, sorry, commentary on metamorphosis from the high medieval era. This, The Vulgate, synthesizes all of Ovidian scholarship from the 11th to the 13th centuries. Um, and it was a teaching tool for both students and masters. And in, in medieval manuscripts, if you've ever looked at one, they're very big and they'll have the original text and then they'll have little margins where people would write things in beside them. And this commentary was marginal commentary, which means that they had all this actual poetry and then they would write things in the margins that they wanted to add. So this marginal commentary included explaining words that Ovid used and references, um, allegorical content as they did, as we just talked about, and larger moral, le moral lessons that you could take away from the poetry. And it also connects his poetry with authors and ideas that were popular during that era and traces his, his influence on poets through the medieval era as well. His reputation for criticizing rulers as he got when he went against Augustus's rule is also passed down through the ages to a poet called John Gower, who used Ovidian technique to criticize the rule of Richard II. It was also well known that he was the favorite poet of Chaucer, who admired his narration and uh, storytelling abilities and includes many allusions to him in his famous poem, Canterbury Tales. Especially in the episode of Canterbury Tales called The Wife of Bath, um, it includes direct references to the tales of Argus and Io and Midas, which are myths in the Metamorphoses. Lines uh, 958 to 988 in The Wife of Bath, if you want to check them out, include the main speaker of the poem relating the entire myth of Midas and ends the speech by encouraging readers to go and read Ovid if they want to know how the story ends. Ovid also inspired the famous poet Dante, who um, alludes to many of Ovid's myths in his Commedia, which is like a Christian book of metamorphoses. Dante also connected to Ovid as a person who'd been banished. Dante himself was banished from Florence and wrote about it like Ovid did. Um, even though their experiences in exile were very different, and he, Dante also joined the Christian concept of exile, which is that we are all exiled from God and perfection after the fall and the original sin, and connected this with Ovidian literary exile. He also compared Ovid's song and error to the original sin. Ovid's also alluded to in Petrarch, as well as a host of other medieval poets. Um, but unfortunately, the references to him weren't always good. In Marie de France's Lays, um, there's a depiction of Venus, the goddess, throwing Ovid's art of love into a fire, which symbolizes fidelity in this particular um, story that she wrote. So that's equating him to, um, again, the erotic in a not so good way. And the feminist writer, um, Christine de Pizan, thought that Ovid basically started the misogynistic tradition in his love poetry. And there were also many Christians who thought that he corrupted natural love with um, the art of love. A more unusual reference to Ovid is found actually in the practice of alchemy. Probably because he was a school text and he wrote about transformations, 
and the seven major metals that they were working with back in the medieval era were named after the gods of Roman mythology, so it wasn't a stretch to start connecting Ovid's poetry to the science of alchemy. Um, it's easily construed as kind of an allegory. So what they basically did was um, some alchemists believed, believed that poets were actually writing philosophy and that the stories they told had a foundation and truth hidden within the mind of the poet. So they connected Ovid to alchemy in ways like um, they would say that uh, Theseus, in the myth of Theseus, saps the Minotaur's strength by introducing a golden substance into the labyrinth, which, which suggested to them adding sulfur to react with a poisonous form of mercury. And they also applied it in ways um, like warnings for the alchemists not to heat solutions too much or allegories for the difficulty of alchemy. Even the famous scientist Sir Francis Bacon prescribed to this theory, referring to the natural science of Ovid and Virgil as the wisdom of the ancients. And that's all we have for medieval um, receptions of Ovid, but tune in next week for a look at the Renaissance receptions all the way into the Enlightenment.